Biological Reasons, a podcast dedicated to exploring the impacts of evolution on human mind and society. And before getting to today's podcast, I'd like to take a moment to encourage you to support the show. There's a couple ways you can do this. First, by buying any products through any of the Amazon links on the site. Especially, I draw your attention to that widget up at the top that sort of pops down when you go to any page other than the home page. There's actually a little arrow. You can make it go up and down as you please. But if you search for any of the books that we discuss in the podcast, or any other book, or any other product for that matter that you'd like to buy on Amazon, by buying it through that link, at no extra cost to yourself, you can support the show. Because even though it costs exactly the same for you to buy it through that link as going directly to Amazon, by going through the link on my site, you generate commissions for me, for the podcast, from Amazon, which helps support the show and keep it on the air. The other thing is we're going to have a variety of options to make donations that will be there in the right-hand column. They're they're going to change over time, but there will always be some options there to make donations. So if you'd like to make a donation, or as I say, at no extra cost to yourself, simply buy products through the Amazon links on the website, especially that that widget on the top. That would be a great way to support the show, and it would be very much appreciated. Okay, then. So let's get to today's podcast. Biological Realist Podcast. And today I'm joined by Randy Thornhill, Distinguished Professor of Biology at the University of New Mexico. Randy, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Michael. Good to, good to be here. So today we're going to be talking about uh, parasite stress theory, and in particular, a book you co-authored with Corey Fincher called The Parasite Stress Theory of Values and Sociality. But I thought before we leapt right into that, perhaps you could introduce yourself to the listeners, tell them a bit about you. Uh, sure. Let me begin with, um, with scholarly interest, and then I'll kind of go to personal background. How would that sequence uh, work for you? Be great. Yeah. I'm a, a scientist, a, a biology type uh, scientist and professor at the University of New Mexico, as you mentioned. And I've been doing uh, scientific research and publishing uh, that research for uh, 46 years, I guess. Uh, my research has been on various topics. Uh, human behavior and psychology have been my focus over the last 25 years. I've also, uh, and especially early on in my research career, studied, uh, studied insects and birds. A focus across the human research and bird research and insect research has been on sexual selection processes, such as uh, uh, mate choice. Um, in the last 11 years, I focused on the role of infectious disease in the evolution of human psychology and behavior. And I've uh, been, been especially interested in the evolution of uh, the human behavioral immune system, as we've called it, that is the psychological uh, mechanisms and associated behaviors uh, that we have for defending against infectious diseases. And these, uh, this behavioral immune system includes the, uh, our value systems, core values, and so forth that we'll talk about uh, today. Um, over the last 11 years, we've, we've developed uh, this parasite stress theory of values. Uh, also, call, we call it the parasite stress theory of sociality, and I've worked most closely with uh, Dr. Corey Fincher. He's a professor of psychology at uh, Warwick University in the UK, and Corey and I, in developing uh, these ideas and testing them, uh, have also worked with some other, other scholars. Um, uh, Chris Epig, uh, Dr. Chris Epig, Dr. Uh, Kenneth Latendry, uh, Dr. Damian Murray, and uh, Mark Scull uh, Schaller. And the parasite stress theory research um, is what we'll focus on uh, today. And as far as personal background uh, goes, I was, I was born and raised in the heart of Dixie, Alabama. USA in, um, in the totally racially segregated Jim Crow South. 
and the culture I grew up in was way over on the right side of the uh, political continuum of values, a uh, very, very conservative uh, kind of culture, very racist, sexist, classist, traditional conformist, and so forth. And um, kids in that culture were taught to conform and never uh, question authority. The, the authorities in such cultures are uh, religion, uh, government, uh, parents, and so forth. And um, later, as I grew up, I attended an Alabama university, and I discovered at that university, it was Auburn University, that um, all Alabama folks are not extremely conservative. There were some sort of liberal-minded people there at that university. And in 1970, I left Alabama to start uh, doctoral work at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And there I saw for the first time uh, extremely liberal-minded people. This was 1970, right in the heart of the social and cultural revolution, that uh, of values, revolution of values, uh, liberalization of values that occurred in the Western world beginning in the 1960s. And Ann Arbor was uh, a center for uh, that cultural revolution in the United States, uh, said to be the uh, Berkeley of the of the Midwest. So I went up there in 1970 and uh, was amazed at uh, the extreme liberalism I encountered. So I, 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 I was fascinated by the culture I grew up in as I grew up in it and I continue to be today as you'll see and uh, and fascinated by the other end of the political continuum, the, the liberalism and just wondered how people got in the shape they they were in with regard to their values, what are the causes of people's values, and um, and so I have um, I have uh, studied that with this parasite stress theory of values, and I, I attribute my interest in uh, what causes people's values, and uh, to the point where I invested the last eleven years in in uh, research on it. Um, to these uh, cultural experiences I had uh, growing up and developing and so forth, uh, both in the Old South and, uh, and getting out of the Old South and encountering uh, the more liberal world. So I think that was formative, that kind of background was formative in um, what we're going to be talking about uh, today, actually. Okay. That's uh, that's great, and and I think the listeners will see how that, that that personal background will lend some interesting texture to the to the theories that we're talking about as we go on. So that's that's great. Thanks for that. So um, I'm going. So in our discussion, I, I'm going to just refer to you as shorthand. I, I don't mean to be shortchanging uh, Corey Fincher or, or your other colleagues, but just you know you as uh, sure. you, know, you and your colleagues, right? Okay. So um, so in the book that we mentioned off the top there, uh, Parasite the uh, Theory of uh, Values and Sociality. Um, before you get right into the, the parasite theory, you do a couple of interesting things that I, I first wanted to address quickly before we get into the theory because inevitably when anyone, in my experience anyways, inevitably if you try and talk about human sociality through a biological lens, there's certain kinds of responses that you can pretty much depend upon. And I thought that you did a pretty nice job uh, very quickly and efficiently addressing those in the book. And since this podcast is about precisely sort of looking at society through a biological lens, it would be nice to have uh, those perspectives on record. So a couple of things. One is the issue of culture. I mean, my experience is that almost inevitably, if you try and talk about uh, society or sociality biologically, someone will, you know, in a, in a vaguely patronizing voice, tell you that you've totally forgotten about the role of culture. Yeah, no, no, uh, yeah. yeah. So could you, could you say a few words about you know, how, you think, how you think culture is misunderstood and how we, we should better understand it to be able to do this kind of scientific sure. work? Sure. Um, when, when the, the word culture usually refers to, when you, when, you, when you say that, you're usually referring to the behavior uh, of a people in a place and a time, so a, a, a society's culture. Uh, the cultural behavior is um, is is our socially learned behavior, and we have a lot of it compared to comparatively. So, you know, across species, we have we're the most cultural 
uh, species in terms of the uh, amount of our behavior that is socially learned. And to say that our behavior is socially learned is to say that we pick it up through interactions with members of the same species. That's what socially learned uh, means. And those interactions can be of various uh, types. They can be teaching uh, kinds of interactions with other humans, or they can be just mere association uh, that don't involve uh, teaching and learning uh, behaviors and so forth, mere association. But it's these uh, social interactions that gives rise uh, approximately in our lifetimes to uh, our cultural repertoire of behavior. And uh, what uh, evolution by selection in the past uh, did in the deep time past of our species did was make uh, psychological mechanisms that um, are in our brains and all of our brains as humans that um, that pick up cultural items as we as we grow up and and this picking up is is can be uh, conceptualized as a choice process we're 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 inundated with all kinds of ideas and ways of doing and so forth and we select very carefully um, those items uh, from that uh, from that menu that we're hit with we pick those those items that work effectively in dealing with local adversity a good example I often use <clears throat> to illustrate this uh, concept of the way our psychology for cultural acquisition is designed is to to think about language or dialect so the kid is growing up and hearing all kinds of noises, uh, cars and birds and crickets and uh, people jabbering and so forth. And the little human being, very, very, in a very sophisticated way, sorts all that out and selects those portions of that noise uh, that will allow uh, language to be spoken. And then all of a sudden you get this sophisticated language ability coming out of the uh, coming out of the person. Dialect is even more uh, specific in terms of uh, the creation of a cultural repertoire that works effectively against local adversity. You have to, you have to speak the local language, you have to speak the local dialect to be socially uh, successful. And uh, our selection of values uh, we have proposed works the same way. Actually it's been long recognized. The study of the research on core values of people, uh, core preferences uh, of people, cultural values, you might call these things, uh, goes way back. And it was recognized long ago that we're doing choice as we, as we grow up. And, and, uh, but that choice, what we have added, the choice is uh, directed by, some, uh, by the design of these uh, uh, cultural acquisition psychological adaptations that was put in by evolution by selection from infectious diseases. And that's what we have added to the uh, understanding of how we, how we obtain our values. So regardless of the kind of cultural behavior you're talking about, you're talking about an animal with very sophisticated psychological adaptations for selecting certain uh, ideas, cultural items, uh, and not others, rejecting others, that will deal effectively with local adversity. And similarly for the uh, value repertoires that, that we have. They're, they're for dealing with local adversity and specifically the adversity component uh, of interest with regard to understanding our values repertoire is uh, infectious disease level locally. Okay. So I, I'd like to I like to tell people that that um, that culture is not an alternative to a biological explanation, but sort of an expression of biology. Would that be consistent with what you're saying? Absolutely. It's as it's as biological as yeah. our culture is. Our culture and cultural behavior and uh, so forth is as biological as our stomach and ears and eyes. And uh, you know, so biological just means other pertaining to life, and culture is. <laughs> is over pertaining to life as much as our feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you would think that would be obvious. Yeah. It's not always. <laughs> not always. So, You're right. Absolutely. I, I know what you mean. Yeah. 
So the, the other thing I wanted to quickly touch upon before we got into parasite stress was, uh, was the whole question of the naturalistic fallacy, because that's, I mean, that's, that's not so much something that's, uh, that's thrown at someone as an argument. It's sort of like a, 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 it's, it leads to misinterpretations, and sometimes one suspects even willful misinterpretations of arguments. And I, and I thought, again, you and Corey Fitcher did a nice job of uh, explaining how to get the relationship between ethics and science right. Can you say a few words about that? Uh, yes, uh, I think that is very basic, as you as you point out, to to you know to get to get under your belt so you can proceed uh, right. in thinking about this stuff and and thinking about um, thinking about how humans relate. Uh, to nature and to science in general. Uh, the, the naturalistic fallacy is a logical fallacy, uh, an illogical way of uh, thinking about the world. And basically, it is, uh, it is as pointed out long ago by, uh, in, in philosophy, it's uh, the, the thinking that uh, the way the world is, or so the fact about the a world, the fact about nature, uh, gives you a moral guidance. That fact tells you what is moral or, depending on interpretation, what is immoral. But it gives you moral guidance. So that's, it is sometimes said uh, briefly that the naturalistic fallacy is the belief that what is uh, is what ought to be. So is gives you what is in the world, uh, what is true in the world gives you, uh, gives you what ought to be, gives you the moral guidance. And uh, the, the fallacy is um, that what is in the world, that is, uh, the structure of nature, the pieces of nature, uh, the materialistic processes that make the natural world, all the natural world, uh, have no morals in them. They're not, uh, they're not, there's no inherent morality in the materialistic processes that have made uh, the planets or human beings or petunias or whatever. So there's no, uh, there's no morality there. The morality comes from people's values, not from uh, the, the way uh, nature is, um, is put together. So, so scientists uh, emphasize that um, you know, just don't make the naturalistic fallacy. You can't, you can't legitimately, from science, from scientific findings and scientific ideas, um, say anything about uh, moral right or moral wrong. Now, that is not to say that there's no connection between uh, between science and uh, morality. There are two uh, two legitimate connections between. Uh, science and morality, although science can't tell you what is morally right or wrong. Uh, science is the way to understand uh, values, morality in general, because values and morality have causes, and what the scientific method is about is, um, is uh, determining the causation of things in nature, and values uh, are a part of uh, our natural world and uh, have causes, both proximate and ultimate. Uh, both, you know, immediate causes and evolutionary causes, uh, like every other uh, feature of living things. So the study of the scientific study of values is no different than uh, the study of the uh, what causes the giraffe's neck. Basically, they're equally uh, legitimate scientifically. The other connection between uh, values and <clears throat> and science is that if you have if you have uh, a set of values about what you want to be I mean values values are about what people want what they really want their core preferences and uh, if you have a, a set of, of values about what you want you want to you want to uh, reduce uh, you want to reduce uh, murder rates. Uh, or some other crime you have, uh, and that's a general that's a general value across the world. Murders outlawed and so forth, because people want to reduce it. If you want to reduce, uh, if you want to achieve uh, a a goal uh, like that, a moral goal, then of course you have to understand uh, the causes involved, and that science gives you. Uh, that the causal information is the only way you can get understand the causes of things is to apply the scientific method. So, so there is a legitimate connection between science and values to 
uh, identify the way to achieve moral goals. Can identify science cannot identify the moral goals, but it can. It gives you the information you need to achieve whatever moral goals you come up with, whether those moral goals are coming from conservative points of view or liberal points of view. To get to those end points, those goals, those moral goals, you have to understand the causes of the circumstances involved. Otherwise, uh, you're just twiddling your thumbs. You're not going to make any progress. It can be said that uh, that uh, that solu you know people are always suggesting solutions to to our to our problems, social problems, and otherwise. But uh, solutions that suggested solutions that are not based on understanding causation uh, can understand can can achieve nothing. So uh, that's a legitimate connection to. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and I, part, I think part of the part of the reason I think people have so much problem with this is because there actually is a, a long tradition in philosophy and the humanities of actually trying to derive ethical systems from yeah. biology. <laughs> it's a powerful it's, way of thinking. You know, it just it just yeah. it just keeps coming back. It just keeps coming back that somewhere somehow the universe out there that is studied by biologists and physicists and chemists. Uh, contains some moral content, and uh, so, so people try to revive the uh, uh, try to revive that kind of uh, fallacy all the time. You're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This, 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 the search for some kind of ultimate explanation, right? If you can't grant it in God, then you grant it in nature. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so let's get to the uh, the main event. <laughs> Um, uh, parasite stress theory. So I thought maybe a good way of approaching this for the listeners is you could perhaps put it to us as a hypothesis with some kind of explanation of, of why one would postulate this hypothesis and, and what kind of predictions would uh, would come from that and then maybe after that we can look at the how the, those predictions <coughs> turn out. Okay. Um, so let me just kind of frame the theory and then I'll go to the predictions. Uh, and by by when I use the term theory, I'm just I'm just um, I'm just using the scientific version of that term. That is, uh, let me explain. So, in science, the word theory has a lot of clout, and it is it is uh, a set of concepts that have uh, a lot of empirical support. So, there's the theory of evolution, there's the theory of gravity, and so forth. And uh, from these theories, um, scientists derive hypotheses, which are more specific kinds of uh, ideas uh, than the theory. So I think the parasite stress uh, theory thing is uh, is at the point now, given its empirical support, that we can legitimately call it a theory rather than a mere hypothesis. But you can think about in, in terms of testability in the same way. So uh, basically, this parasite stress theory of uh, values or sociality is both an ecological and an evolutionary theory of how people come by their values. That is what causes uh, people's values. On the ecological time frame, that is the immediate time frame of causation, uh, we think what's going on is that as people grow up, uh, they they encounter uh, direct and indirect uh, cues about the uh, prevalence of infectious disease in the environment that they're growing up in, and uh, the various mechanisms uh, involved there that gives them people information as they're proceeding through through development and so forth about the level of infectious disease in the local environment. And um, so if, if they perceive high infectious disease in the local environment as they're growing up, then they go toward the conservative end of, of values. If, on the other hand, they perceive low infectious disease in the environment, then they go toward the liberal end of um, the um, values continuum. So we think of this, this values continuum as a, as a unit dimension from highly conservative uh, over on the right to highly liberal over on the left, and um, there are metrics, uh, psychometric uh, questionnaires, basically, um, that allow that allow uh, researchers to 
place individuals on this uh, continuum based on their scores on these on these questionnaires, and that uh, there's that has been a major area of research in social psychology, the study of uh, core values of people. And you can get individuals' uh, measures, you can get group measures, regional measures, and so forth of, of people's values. So, so, this, so this person is going through development and encountering uh, cues with regard to the prevalence of local infectious disease. And if those cues indicate high infectious disease locally, then the person uh, chooses conservative values to put into his or her cultural repertoire. On the other hand, if there if there are a few infectious disease cues encountered during development, the individual chooses uh, cultural items associated with liberalism. So that's the that's the uh, ecological causal framework. Then you have the evolutionary causal framework, which is as I mentioned earlier briefly. Uh, evolution by selection builds these psychological uh, adaptations for acquiring uh, for acquiring uh, cultural items. Uh, so you have those two levels of um, causation: uh, the proximate, the immediate, and the ultimate, the evolutionary. That is part uh, fundamental to the the theory, and the theory is 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 based on uh, modern knowledge of infectious diseases and uh, so forth, of course, as well. The ecology and evolution of infectious diseases, or more specifically, the ecology and evolution of host uh, infectious disease interactions. One component of that I'll mention up front is that um, so we, we co-evolve and other organisms too. All, all organisms have their infectious diseases, even bacteria do. and. Um, we co-evolve with these infectious diseases, and it's a, it's a constant and unending um, evolutionary race, a co-evolutionary race. So the host is evolving defenses to deal with the infectious diseases. Infectious diseases are evolving to circumvent those uh, defenses and eat the host. And uh, it's never-ending. Uh, it's a never-ending kind of uh, arms race between host and parasite, and the and the race results in a relative immunity in the host to local infectious diseases because that's where the evolutionary action is locally, geographically, locally, geographically, coevolutionary race, which means that um, hosts end up being relatively immune to local infectious diseases, but not immune to infectious diseases across the landscape where a different coevolutionary race has been going on. So immunity, this classical immunity uh, that I'm talking about now, the regular old traditional immunity um, that um, is tissue-based, biochemical-based, and so forth, the T cells and the macrophages and all that, white blood cells, all that stuff is, um, is suited to deal with local infectious diseases, but not infectious diseases outside the local scene. So it, you can. Get, this means that your social interactions with local individuals are are relatively safe because they have local immunity. But your social interactions with non-local individuals, strangers, uh, outgroup people, and so forth, uh, can be quite dangerous because they will they will have uh, different parasites. Once you're not uh, uh, immune to. And by parasites, I mean any kind of infectious agent, whether it be a virus, bacterium, worm, uh, protozoan, uh, whatever, fungus, whatever. So you get that, this localization of classical immunity. Um, humans have two immune systems. As I mentioned, the behavioral immune system and the classical immune system. Here we're talking about the classical immunity being uh, uh, evolving to deal with locals, and so does the behavioral immunity evolve to deal with your local parasite problems, too, on top of the classical immunity. So, um, so this, is the, this is the ecological and evolutionary um, uh, causal scales behind the uh, parasite stress theory of values, and it makes all kinds of, the theory makes all kinds of predictions uh, about um, behavior, of people at the individual level across individuals as well as across groups, and then it makes uh, predictions as well about uh, societal level 
uh, phenomena because it's it's a theory about the core values of people. So if you if you understand the core values of people, then those core values will have um, effects at higher levels, all the way up to how governments are run and so forth. And um, so we've tested uh, we've tested uh, predictions at all those all those levels actually, and uh, found uh, quite a lot of support for the parasite stress theory of values. So at the individual level, for example, you have um, studies that uh, this is a very active area of research now, not one that Corey and I have directly been involved in. Um, but uh, we, of course, uh, are interested in it and, and uh, put it, uh, place it in the context of support of our general theory. But if you take people, take a sample of people, as uh, social psychologists often do, and um, take a sample of people and uh, do something to them, put them in, <laughs> in a study, research study, and what, they, what is being done uh, recently is uh, showing people cues of infectious disease. And this is done by now a standardized slideshow of uh, cues of infectious disease where you show people uh, a dozen slides. Just bring them in, show them, show them slides, slides of uh, a person uh, sneezing, another slide of a dirty toilet, another slide of a, a person with eye infection, another slide of a uh, uh, person's skin pox, and so forth. Those kinds of, those kinds of uh, infectious disease cues. And what happens when people see those slides is they, um, they shift to greater degrees of conservatism. What you get is personality shifts, immediate personality shifts, to um, to uh, more introversion, which reduces uh, inter, you know uh, contact, social contact with others. Uh, you get uh, less openness to new experiences. That's another personality feature that changes um, that as a result of these parasite cues and openness to new ideas and features is, is a more liberal uh, view and uh, promotes uh, a lot of stuff that uh, liberal regions have, um, openness to new ideas and new experiences. So, so people see these parasite cues and they, cl they become more closed-minded is the best way to think about it, rather than open-minded. And that's, a, that's a well established as a conservative <coughs> uh, personality trait. Also, uh, these people uh, who see the who see the uh, parasite cues, process those, um, uh, do a, do an immediate shift to stranger avoidance. So they're they put a face of a stranger up on the computer, and they're very quick to uh, eliminate that uh, computer screen compared to people who who are in the control condition. And we can talk about what that control is. Uh, the research is very sophisticated now and uh, with very good controls. Um, so it's a stranger avoidance kind of effect, too. And, mo and recently, too, what's uh, really, really cool, I think, is show, pe show people these slides, and they redefine immediately their in-group and out-group. So their in-group becomes more restricted. They're pushing, pushing people that they saw initially as suitable for social interaction to their outgroup. And so far, this has only been done with two components of conservative prejudice. Uh, one is uh, ageism. Conservatives are more prejudiced uh, in general, of course. But um, ageism, older people um, receive more prejudice from conservatives. And um, also uh, overweight people do uh, receive more prejudice from conservatives. And if you show, show people these slides, they, their definition of what an obese person is becomes uh, more expansive. So oh, they push, they push average weight people into, into the fat category, basically. Also, huh. the middle-aged people are pushed into the old-age category. <laughs> oh, no. That's that's gonna that area of research in psychology. I think is gonna explode. This whole this whole area of you know the, that you can you can change immediately people's uh, core values by showing them infectious disease cues is uh, is really quite stunning. 
and um, other other uh, research along the same lines. They show people these slides and um, they begin to hear accents differently. Mm. And that's, you know, so what basically what they do is um, they, you ask them, you, so, so you take, you take English words spoken by uh, a person with a Middle Eastern accent or a, a, a German accent or something like that. And you ask people, how close or how much does this uh, verbiage sound like your own accent, your own way you would speak those words? And after seeing these slides, people uh, define those foreign uh, spoken words as more different than their own. So they're seeing, they're they're changing the their 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 boundary as to linguistic in group and out group too, in relation to these cues. So that at the individual level, that is uh, very very nice work. And then supporting the uh, parasite stress theory of values. Then at the and then at the group level, there's there's all kinds of stuff, and that's where we have worked, uh, Corey Fincher and I, and uh, with these other uh, scholars I mentioned early on too, in some cases. Um, but um, so basically, uh, social psychologists and sociologists as well have um, studied core values of people. Uh, across the world and tried to figure out how to how to um, how to label these different values what what uh, components uh, should be included and so forth to distinguish different value types across the world and um, and uh, they've come up with this the standard one uh, in cross-cultural psychology and sociology is the collectivism individualism uh, variable, and um, then political scientists have also been uh, separately uh, very interested in core values of people, and they've come up with a different dimension that they call uh, conservatism, liberalism. But we show uh, in in our book that uh, that these two value systems are are similar. They're not identical, but they are very similar. With collectivism uh, being close to uh, conservatism and uh, individualism being close to uh, liberalism. But the, the study of values has an interesting history too. I mean, it was it plotted along very slowly prior to World War II, but after World War II it just exploded. And the explosion uh, was associated with the reality that uh, people with their values can do some terrible, terrible things, like fascism in uh, Germany and uh, and Italy and so forth, and that there was a big explosion of research. Uh, some of it came, a significant amount of it, came out of Jewish scholars from Jewish scholars that were interested in the, uh, what had happened to the uh, people of Jewish background throughout Europe during the um, during World War II, and then there was a second major explosion of values research. Uh, during the 19, beginning in the 1960s and in the 70s with the uh, social revolution, cultural revolution uh, in the West of uh, liberalization of values. So uh, scholars got interested in it again uh, and there was a big explosion of it. So what we have, what we have done is uh, there's, there's a very rich literature of descriptive literature of values variation across um, across countries of the world, across you know, states of the United States. And so we, we fortunately had all those background data on values uh, to look at the parasite stress theory of values with and uh, to test predictions from it, from the theory. And um, so uh, fundamentally, uh, you should uh, expect, I mean, there would have to be, if we're on the right track, a positive relationship between uh, infectious disease level and, um, and values. With infectious, as infectious disease level increases, uh, you expect increased collectivism. As infectious disease levels increase, said differently, you would expect uh, reduced um, individualism. 
And so we pulled the data together to test those kinds of things. The infectious disease data, too, uh, are very, very good for humans. When you get out of humans, it, it, unfortunately, the, the, the data are not as good. But for human diseases, uh, data are just wonderful. From uh, outfits like the World Health Organization, uh, for international data, and uh, in the United States, we have very good data uh, from the Centers for Disease Control in uh, Atlanta, Disease Control and Prevention. So uh, we have all these data that we looked at. We can look at uh, infectious disease level, various measures of infectious disease um, and that we have. They're all very highly intercorrelated, but uh, slight, with slight different emphasis. Um, in each of these measures of infectious disease, or about six of them that we have looked at total, and then um, all these uh, data on core values of people across regions, across states in the U.S., across countries in the world. And indeed, what we have shown is that uh, as infectious disease increases, uh, uh, collectivism, degree of collectivism increases, said differently, degree of individualism decreases. So that's one way we have we have um, we've looked at it at the at the group level on the regional level. Other scholars have uh, picked up on this recently. Um, uh, we didn't collaborate with these, but they just independently were interested in the parasite stress theory and started looking at it at, at different group levels. So Elizabeth Cashton at the University of Utah has. Has done. Apology to the listeners. We lost the connection, but Randy's back, thankfully, and uh, we're going to try and carry on. Sorry about that. Okay, we're, we're still at, at the level of talking about uh, predictions and tests and so forth of the theory, right, in general. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I also want to mention uh, the work by Elizabeth Cashton, University of Utah. She's done a uh, very, very nice study um, of traditional societies. Uh, from the ethnographic record of anthropology, the kinds of societies that anthropologists study. And these uh, data on these societies is compiled in places like the Human Relations Area File and uh, Ethnographic Atlas and so forth. And she, she looked across uh, these traditional societies uh, at a degree of collectivism in the societies in relation to infectious disease levels. She, um, she herself put together some data on infectious disease levels at the locations of these ethnographic societies. And uh, my colleague Bobby Lowe had uh, also uh, put together, did a lot of work, put together uh, disease levels uh, at these infectious disease, at these um, ethnographic society locations as well. So good data on infectious diseases across the ethnographic societies. And uh, what Elizabeth did was um, uh, develop a scale for collectivism, measuring collectivism in these traditional societies, which was uh, based on, uh, based on uh, how parents train uh, their kids in these societies, how, uh, parental inculcation of children. Is it conservative inculcation or is it liberal inculcation? And the way she measured that was the emphasis of the parental teaching on um, telling the kids about tradition, the importance of tradition, conformity, uh, valuing authority, regardless of whatever it is, and so forth. And that's highly, uh, highly conservative uh, kind of parental teaching. On the other end, the more, most individualistic kind of parental teaching is um, teaching the kids to be independent thinkers rather than interdependent. So independent thinking uh, training is a parental strategy of, uh, of liberal uh, teaching of kids. So she showed that uh, as parasite stress increases um, across these traditional societies, the degree of collectivism measured as uh, uh, parental teaching of kids increases. So she focused on that component of collectivism, which is a, a core component. Of, um, of collectivism. I, I should perhaps uh, I kind of danced around some components of liberalism and, coll and collectivism, but let me try to try to uh, boil that down to the more fundamental components of these two uh, poles of values now. So collectivism can be um, described as, and this is all based on empirical verification uh, 
uh, by uh, scholars for a long time that have been uh, publishing on the characteristics of collectivism and the characteristics of individualism. But collectivism has the component of ethnocentrism, which is a focus on in-group, local, parochial kind of uh, focus. Uh, extended family is important, uh, very, very extended family. And high collectivism, even you're, you know, you're interacting with distant cousins regularly and that kind of thing. Um, so that's one component, ethnocentrism. Another component is xenophobia uh, of collectivism. And it's, uh, it's avoidance, dislike, all the way out to hate of strangers and outgroup people, people that are different from you. Um, and the third component of, of collectivism is uh, what biologists call philopatric, which is love of, of the homeland. So collectivists don't disperse much, whereas liberals do that difference. So liberals have, um, have a more uh, reduced uh, in-group um, and uh, less ethnocentric, you could say, and uh, nuclear family kind of organization rather than a extended family organization. That's a more liberal thing. Liberals also are very open to outgroups, uh, uh, open to new ideas, new kinds of people. Uh, don't worry about the color of people, how people talk, uh, all that kind of, those kinds of differences. Uh, so they're outgroup open. And um, liberal people tend to disperse more as well. So those differences between the two poles are important to keep in mind. And there are subcomponents of all of those, like how the parents teach the kids and, and so forth um, that I've mentioned. Okay. So that was, that was very thorough. So we managed to cover there the, 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 uh, the parasite theory as a hypothesis, uh, the grounds for it, different kinds of tests that have been conducted to test for it, and, and a lot of the results. So there's, there's a lot to digest there. Yeah. For the, for the listeners. Um, so uh, in the early going, the, the, the one feedback I've had on my podcast is that I have to summarize more. So I'm going to take a moment to, uh, to try and summarize. And Red, you can give me an A, you can give me, you can be a letter grade on how I do in terms of this summary. And uh, apologies to the, uh, to the listeners because I'm going to actually read it <laughs> because I'd, I don't think I'd get it right otherwise. Okay. So w what we're talking about then is that evolution has selected for genes that build cognitive mechanisms that acts as a kind of dial or tuner or something, which is tuned by environmental cues to calibrate phenotypes for the degree of the behavioral immune system response. And the result of that, the, the specific behavioral immune system response characterizes uh, distinctive kinds of personality traits that manifest themselves in people's values, their reproductive strategies, uh, their political institutions, along the kinds of uh, spectrums you were just talking about. Is that, is that the gist of it? And it is indeed. That's a very good, uh, very good uh, summary of uh, the, the conceptual uh, basis, indeed. Very good summary. Do I, get an, do I get an A for that? You get an A, yeah. I always like an A. Thank you. I, I would, I, I would, to the uh, to the slightly earlier discussion. I would also want to emphasize that uh, by no means is it just the uh, Corey Fincher, myself, and the other scholars I mentioned we have worked with that are now uh, pursuing research related to the parasite stress theory of values. And I mentioned Elizabeth Cashton too, but it's 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 really growing. Yeah. And within, I get about one paper a month now from journals, various journals across social and behavioral sciences and in, in biology journals and so forth to review uh, for some new study of the parasite stress theory applied to some new uh, component of uh, our living world out there. And uh, the, the, it looks like the economists and sociologists are really, really uh, getting interested in this and applying it to all kinds of of uh, different things, especially the economists, and I'm I'm really happy to see that. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting because one of the things I was going to ask you about, actually, and and, and maybe now we can start move into more of a uh, a, a a probing of of some of the ideas, uh, so actually, because I think we've laid out the theory, and I, I think the listeners. Some of them may be a little overwhelmed, but it's certainly they can understand the, the comprehensiveness. You were talking about the comprehensiveness of the work that's being done, but also the comprehensiveness of the, the topics, the, the kinds of behaviors that, that are affected 
uh, under under parasite stress. It's uh, it's a pretty uh, pretty far reach in theory. So uh, it's a lot for people to absorb in in one uh, you know one listening. Uh, but that uh, gives them reason to go buy the book, right? So, <laughs> so, but, so let's, let's just then try and, uh, and probe this a little bit. Now, you'd mentioned economists, and one thing that struck me reading the book is that I could imagine a number of economists uh, objecting saying uh, something along the lines, well, it's, you know, you have the, whatever, the, you know, the, the cart before the horse, whatever the expression is, that really what goes on is that it's, you know, you need economic development to take place, and then you get good sanitation and nutrition, education, medical care, yeah. and so on, and then you can eradicate parasites, right. right? So you're kind of saying this the other way around, or and actually I think your story is a little more complicated even than that, but I'll just let you explain how you see this. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a good point to raise. Yeah, the uh, parasite stress theory of values um, is a bi-directional theory um, in terms of causation, and, and that's what uh, you're you're touching on, and I want to explain. So, if you if parasite stress, think about it this way: if parasite stress is reduced in a region uh, through uh, through increased sanitation. Okay, so you get uh, you get liberal-minded people uh, in a region. They put in quality sanitation for everybody. Everybody's got clean water, drinking good water. Um, they've got good health care and so forth. All that comes out of uh, uh, out of uh, people con being concerned about strangers. That is fundamental liberalism builds builds that kind of um, uh, society. So. As, as parasite stress is reduced through the actions uh, of liberal-minded um, people that build the infrastructure that reduces parasite stress, then uh, that feeds back, and the kids that grow up, that are growing up, are growing up in environments that are relatively uh, low in parasites, so they're going to be even more liberal-minded than the generation before. And so as you reduce parasite stress, you're getting more and more liberal people. And we think this is what went on uh, during the Cultural Revolution of the 60s and 70s, and in the West specifically, too. There was, a, there was an emancipation gradually of, um, of um, people from high parasite stress associated with various health interventions and sanitation interventions that are well studied and, and uh, well known descriptively. Uh, that we could talk about that that made these liberals uh, in the 60s and 70s specifically and only in the West. But um, so you, if you get liberalism, um, uh, then that feeds back to reduce parasite stress more. As you reduce parasite stress more, you get more liberalism. So the so the causation is bidirectional. We've emphasized, and the same you you know at the same time you can think about the conservatives. So as as parasite stress increases you get more conservative people in the region. The conservative people um, are not interested in strangers. They're just interested in their local in-group and so forth. So you get more uh, social disenfranchisement of the masses. Social disenfranchisement, of course, is associated with, with absence of access to sanitary conditions, clean water, health care, uh, information in general. and. Uh, you get more conservative people. So as infectious disease increases, you get conservatism. Conservatism uh, feeds back and um, and creates um, more parasite stress in the area. And it's a it's a it's a bi-directional kind of thing. So whether you think about it going on with uh, liberalism and parasite stress or conservatism and parasite stress. So that's an important point for the economists yeah. to understand. Yeah. So, so, so it's, a, it's a virtuous circle, right? Yeah. It's, if you can reduce parasite stress, you can increase liberalism, which will increase economic development, which will decrease parasite stress in, around the circle, That's right? right? That's right. Okay. <coughs> or at least the kinds of economic development that, that reduce the parasite. Exactly. Yeah, I thought, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, um, uh, so if this... Oh, and I don't, think, I don't think you mentioned this today, but in the book, you, you definitely say that... Um, that temperature is a um, uh, a good rule of thumb for parasite stress. Right. You know, where the, the hotter, te hotter, wetter temperatures are going to have more parasites. Yeah. That you know, intuitively, most people understand that. So, uh, so my, so my, this has got me wondering if, uh, if you know, with the predictions about 
uh, global warming, and I, there's different predictions, and you know, it's obviously a highly disputed area, but let's say as a you know, rule of thumb, you know, uh, we're looking at a four degree, three, four degree increase of temperature over the next uh, century, would, would that lead par the parasite stress theory to predict that traditionally, uh, or at least recently, uh, cons uh, liberal areas of the world, like New England and Scand Scandinavia, can be expected to actually become more conservative? Yes, it could, it could uh, work that way, actually. And epidemiologists, they're, 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 there's growing literature uh, in just, you know, fundamental or core epidemiology that is um, making those kinds of uh, predictions that, you know, uh, I mean, biologists with the global warming, biologists have spent a lot of time in uh, the last decade uh, talking about changes in the ranges of species. So now you're getting tropical, traditionally tropical species up in the temperate zones and all that kind of stuff, of course, and they, they're working on that. But the epidemiologists are worried about the effect of warming on um, the spread of diseases. And um, so all else equal, as you say, diseases like it uh, wet and warm. And, um, and uh, so if you increase temperature, uh, you're going to uh, going to help the infectious diseases, and therefore uh, you're going to promote more conservative values and so forth in regions that were traditionally uh, liberal. Now, what that that's kind of all else equal. What we don't know is how uh, human innovation <coughs> is going to interact with that. Now, of course, that's right. right. And uh, human innovation can be quite uh, spectacular. And uh, I mean, there's a there's a big literature on um, you know regional variation and in innovation, which we capitalize on too. Liberal liberal minded people are more open to experience, and that includes some people that uh, get pretty doggone innovative. And um, so all the uh, you know most of the innovation uh, measured in various ways. Um, is associated with low parasite uh, regions. And uh, so if you get, you know, a place like Scandinavia and so forth that are so progressive, uh, innovative and democratic, um, that kind of place, uh, I mean, they, you, you may have some people there that can keep ahead of the, uh, of the disease problems as they progress, <coughs> as they progress uh, with the warmer temperatures. But, you know, in the in the absence of, in, of of appropriate innovation, I mean, it's it's possible that in 200 years we'd have uh, epidemic or in, endemic, uh, rather is the right term, endemic malaria as far north as uh, is Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> Vancouver, no less, you say. So. <laughs> yeah. You got plenty of water. You got plenty of wet. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, That's right. Mosquito, the mosquitoes. I mean, when you get when you get it, the epidemiology of this stuff gets really cool when you get vectors involved. And a lot of our diseases are just direct kind of contact or semi-direct through oral, fecal, and so forth. But when you get uh, when you get uh, vectors, ticks, and mosquitoes, and all things can happen. But uh, interesting, really interesting. But mosquitoes uh, and other arthropods that vector lots of human diseases are very sensitive to a frost and uh, just can't make it if it uh, can't make it through the through the generation um, if, if it fro if it's a significant frost so but if you know if that changes um, then we're going to have more more problems it's going to be a constant Zika kind of <laughs> Zika <laughs> worry or Ebola worry you know yeah <clears throat> okay all right, so let's move on then to um, to uh, so I, when we first talked about doing this podcast, I I, I mentioned to you that I I had I, I was I really found the whole collectivism individual thing very persuasive, but I wasn't as convinced about the the mapping. And at times in the book, I thought it was like you're making a one to one mapping, but you you qualified at times, and even today you've qualified it a bit. Uh, the mapping of the conservative liberal spectrum onto that. So I'd like to ask a, you know a couple of questions in relation to this but before doing that for the sake of the listeners I want to I want to add a couple of caveats um, first of all I hope I'm not descending into um, semantic squibbling uh, uh, squabbling rather because I, I don't think that that's you know that's useful um, but I do think these terms are 
used in different ways by different peoples, and we have to be clear what we're talking about to uh, to to be to, to use these terms usefully. And another thing is a, a, a criticism that, that I would not make, but which I think some people might make. And I'd be and I think I know what you say to this, but I'll put it to you anyway. Some people might say, "Oh, but look, you know, there are people who are born and raised in." conservative areas who have liberal values and vice versa, conservative people you know, born and raised in areas of liberal values, um, and yet these people on average are subjected to the same parasite stress, therefore parasite stress can't be the explanation of the value. So I, I, I don't think this is a very telling criticism, but I, I, I'd no, love that's to. That's a good one. That one comes up a lot, and I, I okay. often um, uh, use it to explain in more detail uh, where we are coming from. And okay then. Important nuance. Let's start there with your. You had you had a lot of a lot of stuff in what you just. Okay. Let's start with the last comment you made. Okay. So uh, I'm one of these one of these apparent, emphasize apparent exceptions because I grew up in in a very diseasy part of the world, a very diseasy time, and uh, there were in my high school, public high school in Alabama little town in Alabama, there were uh, three liberal-minded people. <laughs> you all knew each other, right? <laughs> one, one of those ended up uh, working for the National Democratic Party, which she, she still does. A second one is a, a second liberal in my high school, is a civil rights lawyer in South Alabama, where there are a lot of civil rights problems still, because of the parasites, basically. And I was the third one, and I'm a, I'm a biology professor at the University of New Mexico, the third one. But the rest of them were pretty conservative to some, you know, to varying degrees, and, and I, I, I just love all these, these people and get together with them and have learned a lot from them and, and um, think they're all fantastic. But it's just, uh, it's, a good, it's a good way to get into this apparent exception thing. So what's going on with these three people? And I'll take me as as uh, the best known case, because I don't know the, the developmental background of these other two people, uh, but I suspect that uh, they share with me some important things, and that is we just weren't sick very much. And then why weren't we sick very much? Well, we had uh, reasonably smart, at least, parents who gave us what medical care was down there, and which was not as good as in other areas. We've done all this stuff on uh, regional variation in medical care and so forth, um, done that research, or pulled together the data done, done by others. Uh, but So that's one component. And uh, the second is we just happen to have the, uh, the genetics to deal with the, with the local infectious diseases. And uh, that allowed us to, despite the infectious disease levels in our environment, uh, we had uh, fewer earaches and uh, other, uh, other. I mean, and, you know, I talked to my mother when she was alive about my health background. And uh, she said I was the only kid in the neighborhood, so it's in the in group that didn't have earaches all the time. And... Um, and uh, you know, a lot of my friends are uh, are uh, deaf, or almost deaf, because of all the earaches they had, and and eye infections were very very common. I never had a single eye infection. Everybody, all the kids had eye infections all the time, and and other kinds of infectious diseases. And these the experiences with infectious diseases we think work such that the so, of course, when you have an infectious disease, your classical immune system is activated. So that you read that as data about infectious disease locally. The, the, the number of activations, the duration of activation, and that's important in, um, in directing you um, one direction or the other in terms of which values you pick up for the um, optimal values. And, um, you know, the, the, I, was, I was like a fish out of water in that culture because I was relatively liberal-minded. In addition, I was left-handed. <laughs> that's, uh, that's very nonconformist. And uh, colleagues have done a, a very interesting study on handedness, uh, actually, 
um, and shown that the conservative cultures, um, left-handers are very, very uncommon. And I think the kids are just uh, forced to, you know, to go right, you know. And I was, I was encouraged, said at least to go right, but I resisted. And also, uh, I mean, you know, I was told all the time, um, told all the time, don't be a doubting Thomas. You know, think like everybody else. Don't think about that weird, those weird things you think about. And um, and uh, curiosity killed the cat. I heard that one about at least every month. You remember curiosity kills a cat. Don't think outside the box. That's that's very much a, the training that uh, is associated with conservatism. But but um, but I was different. Um, and um, in the, in those regards, and I, I, and I've thought about that a lot. And these alleles that so basically, if you look at at uh, my background, which I've gotten very interested in uh, genealogy, and uh, if you look at my background, it is an interesting combination, uh, largely European. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, UK basically Thornhill. Thornhill and Pickens and Norton, but there were some uh, Native Americans in there uh, too. And uh, if you look at the crunch uh, that the Native Americans went through with the bringing over of all those nasty diseases by by um, by Europeans, uh, they went through a, a very strong sweep of natural selection and uh, built some very good classical immune systems. So the survivors, the uh, Native American mm -hmm. survivors mm -hmm. of that uh, selection sweep from the uh, European diseases uh, had very, very good genes with regard to local immunity. So I had this combination of European genetics and, uh, and, uh, and Native American genetics that had gone through the selection sweep. And so I, I think about that. I may I may be wrong with regard to, to why I'm liberal, but uh, uh, you know I think the exceptions uh, may may indeed explain the rule. Well, that's interesting. The interesting response because it's not what I was expecting you to say actually. <laughs> so what, what I was anticipating you saying, and I'm wondering how, how you would respond to this, yeah. is that a possible explanation would be that uh, people just th th this 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 cognitive mechanism that regulates the behavioral immune system may just be more or less sensitive in certain people. So that people, you know, if, if it's you know less sensitive, if you live in a conservative area, you will not react as strongly to the parasite cues as your neighbors and vice versa if you're more sensitive if you, if you live in a liberal area you might res respond more strongly to much subtler cues yeah. than your neighbors would gotcha. do. and that's probably a factor I mean you um, yes but I think there's more yeah um, <laughs> there's always more <laughs> yeah but with regard to what you're saying I mean I mentioned that the slideshow research earlier on Yes, yes, and yes. if you measure the values of these people before you show them the slides, right, right. Uh, the conservative people that, that go into the study, the conservative uh, research participants, um, show a stronger response to the yeah. to the yeah. parasite slides than do the liberal-minded people. So they are more sensitive to cues of infectious disease, and the infectious disease experiences. Uh, even in slide, even in a slideshow, will cause a, a greater uh, shift to increased conservatism than will liberals. Um, than will than will the same cues uh, when processed by liberal brains. So I think that that is indeed uh, a factor as well. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's let me get into a couple of these. Uh, you know, I've taken you more than the time I said I would take you. Are you okay to go a couple minutes longer? Sure. I, I didn't. I didn't really get into your your uh, point about the variation these levels and these labels, right? That's something I, I think is important to uh, touch on. And well, let me let me. Can, can I, let, let, how about I ask you? Maybe if I ask you a question, and it will sort of set okay. you up to answer it, but also will give the listener something concrete to think through as you're discussing it. How's that? All right. Okay. Good. So. So uh, one of these things is the is the discussion of liberalism. You uh, uh, connect it to both uh, individualism and egalitarianism. So 
my perception is that at least in the North American context, and this is something we'll probably have to talk about because the word liberal means something different in, in the European context, yeah. at least in the North American context, uh, liberals are usually people who want to promote uh, individual growth or potential, but they want yeah. to do it through creating an, uh, egalitarian opportunities, and so they usually want the state to get involved uh, in terms of uh, dis uh, redistribution of income and regulating various um, uh, interactions between people, and they will endorse a uh, form of course of taxation to support this this uh, redistri 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 <laughs> the state that redistributes, I can't say the word now, and regulates. Um, and they will justify this on the basis that it's for the common good, right? To protect against free riding and, and the potential dangers to the, um, uh, the tragedy of the commons type outcomes. Um, but that almost sounds to me like collectivism, right? There's a lot of collectivism involved in that kind of thinking. So that, that's where I start wondering how these two, uh, you know, the, these two spectrums uh, map up onto each other. So, so how would you respond to that? That, okay, let me answer that specific question, and then, and then if time allows, we can even get more general and go uh, to the bigger picture. But the um, so the liberalism um, has a has this fundamental component of individual thinking, individual expression, which empirically is individualism. Okay, that component. And then liberalism also has this component of um, equality of people. That there's no there's no uh, worth in um, in thinking of some people as more human than the other, and than others. That they're all equal um, and deserve uh, deserve opportunity and so forth. And um, and various brands of liberalism focus differently on the equality part of that. And liberalism is always individualistic, regardless of the kind of liberalism you're talking about. Whether you're talking about liberalism, John Locke liberalism, or you know, classical liberalism, or libertarianism. The individualism component is very, component, very important. It's what, what varies is that equality component. Uh, of people, and if you take uh, libertarianism, it drops to some degree. Doesn't I do not mean to say it drops altogether. That would be wrong. That's not what I'm saying. It reduces the importance of the um, equality component. Lib uh, libertarianism does, and if you take this continuum we talked about, if you take this continuum we talked about, where you have high conservatism. Uh, on uh, on the right and uh, high liberalism on the left, so high liberalism is low conservatism and vice versa. I think libertarianism is uh, somewhere at the middle of this, with a with a real big focus on individualism. Uh, people can think for themselves. Uh, they uh, have opportunity and make their make their own decisions, run their own lives, all that kind of stuff that uh, that's there and um, paramount in libertarianism as well as classical liberalism. But what, what differs is this equality thing, and uh, libertarians will uh, reduce uh, the importance of that. I mean, lib the this, this strong liberal, strong is not the right word either, let's say extreme liberal, classical liberal, says, thinks about it this way. Some people out there cannot do for themselves. It's not that they don't want to do for themselves, they cannot do for themselves. And we must take care of those people. And that requires what some will call coercive means. That is, the government getting involved and giving those people opportunity and health care and education and, and so forth, because they can't do it. And we value them as much as we value uh, high status people and so forth, and so therefore uh, we've got to do it. So I think it's the equality component of liberalism, and that's really, um, really right, kind of in the middle. I think on the on the unidimensional thing rather than orthogonal.
Right. So that's where I would start with that. Now, on these labels you talk about, it indeed, you know, who called some people, I mean, you know, the political science have pointed this out a long, uh, for a long time. You cannot believe what a person tells you his or her. Right? <laughs> that's <laughs> right. got to measure them. You got to that's measure right. them. So they worked their butts off to come up with metrics to measure them. They got these scales that, you know, have validation and so forth across cultures. They can measure they can measure a person's values. Because you get things like, uh, you know, uh, Red China saying, you know, we're a democratic republic uh, or the Democratic Republic of Africa or something like that saying it's a democratic place. You get the uh, Southern Democrats. <laughs> in the culture I grew up with, claiming they were Democrat. And right. uh, so, you know, people will say whatever works for them as a social strategy uh, to influence whoever they're trying to influence, uh, they will use those labels. And people do this all the time. People, you know, a lot of people, my, some of my colleagues will say, well, I'm socially liberal, but I'm economically conservative, you know. Right, and right. uh the econ if you're economically conservative, then uh, you're dropping uh, priority on the equality thing because you're you're saying that it's quite all right to have that big uh, big uh, distribution wealth distribution uh, inequality distribution and so forth. So that's not very liberal. It's not as liberal as a person who's against who's uh, who's against that sort of thing. So that's just a, kind of a start on, a, on this labeling thing and uh, where, um, where liberals, I think, vary in uh, the components they vary in. And, uh, and I, I'd like to get your, your, uh, your views on that as well. Well, <laughs> no, I, I think that's a really valuable uh, explanation to offer. That I'm glad we have that out for the uh, for the podcast because if people slip, you know, going back to the beginning of our conversation, if people slip up on the naturalistic fallacy stuff, it's very easy to start misinterpreting or uh, interpreting in all kinds of you know uh, self-serving ways the the meaning of these terms, particularly as they as they work within you know within your theory. Okay. So. I think that was a valuable, uh, a valuable thing to get clear. Let me add one more thing, Michael. May I? Yeah. Um, some of my, some of some people I know who work in uh, research related to mine would say um, that have been against um, the study of uh, the evolution of human behavior and psychology from an evolutionary or from evolutionary points of view. Uh, there are such people in academics, and you know that, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> They're not uncommon, actually. I, I think I've run into all of them with uh, yeah. some of my things through the through the through my career. But these people call themselves liberals, right? And you know they can call themselves liberal. You can call yourself whatever you want uh, to. But I question the uh, their liberalism because because if you look traditionally at the opposition to scientific advance. It has come from uh, very conservative-minded people uh, back to the anti-Enlightenment time, those folks that hated the Enlightenment and so forth. They were a bunch of conservatives. And these people are doing the same thing. They're just, they're just keeping the anti-Enlightenment movement uh, alive if they're opposing evolution uh, being applied to human behavior and psychology because that's the most important information we have. Uh, about our species and uh, fundamental to how you you know thinking about people on a high plane you have to understand we're evolved organisms uh, so I, they can call themselves liberals but I, I question it and, and and you know you could you could study that empirically so you have you give them the questionnaire on conservatism liberalism that you know, is used typically in research to measure individuals uh, conservatism liberalism and see where they come out and my guess is that uh, such people would uh, would be would be a little farther would be you know right of center uh, on uh, on the uh, conservatism scale. Yeah, and there's and there's of course in, in the humanities and social sciences there've long been people who've been uh, openly explicitly hostile to science, as yeah. as, you know, science as an ideology of its own sort of thing. 
But, uh, but I think the problem really more is the, the, those inside the gates, those who ostensibly are scientists but take these kind of positions on science. Yeah, uh, that's I guess. dangerous to us all because if they're on the inside, then they're, you know, they, have, uh, they have the respect of some, their opinions, and uh, also they review grants and papers and so forth that can uh, slow the scientific progress and understanding science in general, but especially understanding human behavior. Yeah. 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 Well, we should probably start wrapping up, Randy. Okay. So could I invite you then to uh, just, I mean, as you said, this is a comprehensive theory. I think people who have listened to the podcast understand uh, or have some sense anyways uh, uh, of how extensive the, uh, the, the reaches of this theory. But I wonder if you could, for the final question, just sort of distill it down. What, what If you could communicate to the general public one in vital lesson that comes out of this research, from your perspective anyways, uh, what would that be? Okay, um, that's a good question. Let's see. I would, uh, I would cast it really as two messages. Um, one to scholars interested in the causes of values and the uh, implications of those values at various levels. We talked about the effects of those values at various levels. And then another um, message to uh, people who, um, who have humanitarian goals. And these could be the same people, uh, of course in these two categories. Uh, to people who are interested in, uh, you know, scholarly, in, have scholarly interested in the causes of values and, and the things values give rise to, I would say, um, I would uh, recommend uh, uh, realism, getting real, with the importance of uh, infectious diseases in shaping human behavior and psychology. It, uh, infectious diseases as causes of uh, social life now is cool, and it's about time, but, uh, but uh, I could see uh, more emphasis being placed on that um, among the scholars who are interested in, uh, in values. Uh, so that's the message I would give to those folks. And then to the humanitarian, people interested in humanitarian things, um, in how humanitarian improvements of the world, fixing the world, so to speak, um, I would uh, recommend uh, also getting real about infectious diseases and how infectious diseases affect our values and the effects of values then on uh, prejudice, uh, warfare, uh, attitudes toward killing out groups, uh, all those things that humanitarian interests uh, would like to focus on, reduced sexism, uh, reduced classism, all those things. So, um, so those are my two messages, one to scholars interested in the uh, causes of AIDS and one to people who are serious about uh, uh, improving humanitarian conditions in the world. My guest today has been Randy Thornhill. Randy, thanks for joining me on the show. Sure. Thank you, Michael. And okay. Take care. Bye-bye. That's today's show. Thanks for listening. The Biological Realist Podcast is available on YouTube, but we'd encourage you to come to our homepage. That's Michael McConkey, Michael, M-C-C-O-N-K-E-Y, McConkey, dot com slash the Biological Realist Podcast. If you come there, you can find a full inventory of all the shows that we've done and show pages that give you more information on the various guests. Plus, you have the opportunity to support the show by either making donations or buying products through Amazon that at no extra cost to yourself can generate commissions that help us keep the show on the air. So thanks very much for listening, and watch out for us next time. We look forward to see you in the next episode of The Biological